and welcome to lesson 4.4, Mining and Resource Extraction. The content in this video is aligned to the third edition of Environmental Science for AP and is aligned to CED Unit 5.9. Here are our content objectives for this lesson. Humans can mitigate their impact on land and water resources through sustainable use. At the end of this lesson, you should be able to Identify the different methods of mining and resource extraction. Describe natural resource extraction through mining. Explain how various resources are refined after extraction. Explain how resources are transported after extraction. Compare and contrast mining methods based on a cost benefit analysis. And describe the ecological and economic impacts of natural resource extraction through mining. This leads us to answering our guiding question. How do we access lithospheric resources? Mining is the process of extracting minerals or resources from the lithosphere. It is done in order to access a variety of resources either near the surface or just beneath it. Typically, we refer to what we are mining as minerals, but there are three major categories of minerals, metallic, non-metallic, and energy bearing. Metallic resources come from ores and are further divided into two categories. Non-precious metallic resources are often used for manufacturing or industrial practice. Good examples of these are iron, aluminum, and zinc. Precious metallic resources include gold, silver, and platinum and are used for jewelry and advanced electronic components. Non-metallic resources are things like limestone, salt, mica, potash, and marble. Lastly, there are energy resources, which we know as our fossil fuels and nuclear raw material. Known amounts that are economically viable, called reserves, exist for the majority of the resources that we mine. In general, mining is done in one of two basic ways, surface or subsurface. Let's take a look at each of these and their subtypes in turn. Surface mining is used when the resource in question is close to the surface and generally easy to reach. This is done in one of four ways, open pit, area strip, contour strip, and mountaintop removal. Each of these is associated with large disturbance of land and the surrounding ecosystems. Open pit mining is associated with digging a large pit down into the crust to access a resource. It has concentric rings around the sides for transporting the resource from the bottom of the pit to the top. Contour and area strip are very similar in that they are designed to remove large amounts of materials in strips or rows. The difference is that area strip mining is done on flat surfaces and contour is done along the topography of a mountain. Both area and contour strip mining produce what is known as overburding or the useless parts of the soil that don't contain usable material. In contour strip mining, this overburden is often piled up in what is known as a high wall. Lastly, mountaintop removal occurs when the peaks or summits of mountains are removed through explosives to make contour or area strip mining more effective. Subsurface mining, on the other hand, takes place beneath the surface of the crust in what we think of as traditional mines. Shafts can be dug vertically or at an angle, and the majority of subsurface mines fall into one of two categories, long wall or room and pillar. These terms describe what the support system of the mine is. In room and pillar, wide areas are cleared out to obtain material, but thick columns of stone are left to support the weight of the crust above. Long wall mining is done through the use of machinery that strips material horizontally from the rock. Hydraulic supports are used to support the roof until the machine moves further along. The supports are then moved and the roof is allowed to collapse in the mined areas. Lastly, you have what is known as in situ mining, which is also known as in situ leaching. This process is achieved by pumping a leachate fluid into layers of porous rock. This dissolves the mineral in question and the solution of which can be pumped out and separated using a variety of processes. Here you can see these mining methods in a different way. Let's discuss the byproducts of mining. When these areas are excavated, the overburden, or the rocks, soil, and surface vegetation that do not contain the desired material, is, is displaced and must go somewhere. 
In many cases, this overburden or spoils are piled up near the mine. Associated with contour mining, this overburden often gets piled together in what is known as a high wall, which can become unstable and cause damage. Sometimes these materials are put through placer mining, which is the process of using flowing water to extract minerals or resources. This is most often used with materials like diamonds and gold. You probably think of this when you think about the process called panning. More often, however, the water is mixed with chemicals and other materials and becomes something known as a tailing. These tailings become a large part of the problem associated with mining known as acid drainage. We've discussed how the raw materials that we mine are extracted. After extraction, the material must be transported and refined in order to be of any use. In most cases, the raw material is useless for the purposes we need it for until it has been refined in processes such as distillation, smelting, or a specific combination of processes like the Bessemer process. After extraction, minerals are transported through trucks, cars, rail, or pipelines, and they're transported to refining plants that are designed to remove impurities or to separate out different components of the resource. Processes such as smelting are used to melt metallic resources to remove impurities and provide a pure component of the ore for use in a manufacturing process or for jewelry. Distillation is used with petroleum and gas resources. The resource is treated in some way, typically by heating to the point of boiling, to produce what is known as fractionation. Various molecular compounds of the resource separate out based on their molecular size and their boiling point. Then the different components are siphoned off to go to a specific use. This is how crude oil is able to produce the raw materials of gasoline, jet and diesel fuel, fuel oil, asphalt, and other petrochemicals. After refining, the resources must once again be transported to the location where they will be used. This comes again through trains, trucks, and pipelines. Then comes distribution, use, and in some cases, waste. Materials like steel, aluminum, gold, and silver can be recycled and used again to produce either the same or different items. This is what is known as post-consumer recycling. This is almost exclusively associated with metallic ores that are mined. Mining has a variety of impacts that are important for us to explore. These impacts extend from human health hazards to environmental degradation. Regarding human health, the major issues associated with mining come from disease that is a result of exposure to materials like coal dust or other chemicals used in the mining process, as well as potential energy from malfunctioning machinery or collapsing structures like subsurface mines and high walls. The environmental impacts are more varied. Let's begin with the obvious, land disruption. Depending on the location of the mine and the topography of the area around it, it can contribute significantly to deforestation, soil erosion, soil compaction, water quality degradation, and biodiversity loss. Large swaths of land have to be cleared for surface mining, regardless of what type it is. Subsurface mining can lead to the process called subsidence, where the overlaying rock collapses due to a lack of support further down. This can also contribute to what is known as a sinkhole. Based on the topography, soil erosion can also be an issue particularly for contour strip mining. Flying debris from mountaintop removal may damage both humans and nearby ecosystems. Potentially loosened soil may be carried off by runoff into nearby bodies of water, increasing turbidity, sedimentation, and possibly contributing to eutrophication. This brings us to our next problem, acid drainage. We already know that mining uses a variety of materials and chemicals to extract desired minerals and to process these minerals at the surface. When these chemicals mix with runoff, they can lead to acid drainage, where the water develops either an acidic pH or may potentially go through the chemical reactions required to produce strong acids. This can eat away at rock beds, contaminate local bodies of water, and infiltrate into the soil. Additionally, we have to deal with the management of tailings and overburden. Where should they go? How should they be treated? And is it safe to use them in the reclamation process? Taken together, land disruption, acid drainage, and the remaining waste products 
leave us with the perfect recipe for biodiversity loss. And this isn't even considering the carbon footprint of producing and running the machinery for excavation, transport, and refinement. However, because of the massive impact that mining has on the soil, it is one of the heaviest regulated industries in the United States. These regulations are put into place to minimize damage as much as possible, as well as to provide for individuals harmed in the process. There are two major laws that you should be familiar with when it comes to mining. The first is the General Mining Act of 1872. This law provided for the encouragement of Western settlement by allowing individuals to claim mining rights on the land they settled, even if it was federal land. This then gave them the ability to determine how, when, and to what extent they would mine the resources they found. As it is written, the law does not provide any guidance or compulsion to engage in site management or cleanup, to use the least damaging mining methods, or for the owner to bear any kind of financial responsibility for any damages caused. These came later, when the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act, or SIMCRA, was passed in 1977. This law requires that companies not only comply with NEPA, but that they also put up a bond or a value of money equal to the proposed reclamation process prior to the start of the operation. Upon completion, the company must make adequate attempts to reclaim or replace the land in as close to natural estate as possible, the mine in which they were working. The reclamation process must address issues like those we discussed a moment ago, acid drainage, soil loss, biodiversity disruption. Only when the government, typically managed by the Bureau of Land Management and the Office of Surface Mining, are satisfied with the reclamation process does the bond get returned. If the company does not follow these guidelines, the bond is retained to do the reclamation process. Unfortunately, it is not unheard of for mining companies to low bid the reclamation process, post the bond, and then surrender it as this is often cheaper than doing the full rep reclamation process itself. The following slide provides you with an opportunity to see how some of these ideas are connected together. Feel free to pause the video and explore the connections between these topics. Then use the statements at the beginning to review.